first determine if the formula is that of an ionic compound. One way of doing this is reading the formula left to right. If the first atom listed in the formula is a metal and it is followed by one or more nonmetals, it's likely to be an ionic compound. The one exception to this general rule is NH4 plus the ammonium ion. This will be listed at the beginning of the formula, but NH4 consists of nonmetals. Next, identify and name the cation and the anion. The cation is the positively charged component of the formula, and the anion is the negatively charged component of, of the formula. Metal ions take the name of their corresponding neutral metal. For example, all of the metals in the periodic table retain their name. So a zinc ion is simply called zinc, a chromium ion is simply called chromium, sodium, sodium, calcium, calcium, etc. On the other hand, monatomic anions are named like their corresponding nonmetal, but with an IDE suffix. For example, nitrogen, oxygen become nitride and oxide, fluorine, chlorine, bromine become fluoride, chloride, bromide, etc. Polyatomic ions have specific names. Here's a list included in one of your lab documents. It includes the one polyatomic cation, ammonium, the one exception to the metal nonmetal guideline, and quite a number of polyatomic anions. Again, the anions are the negative component of the formula. You can see most of these polyatomic anions consist of nonmetals. Yes, there is an exception or two with polyatomic anions. The exception from being all nonmetals, there are three you'll likely encounter in this course. Chromate, dichromate, and another one called permanganate, which is on another list I'll show you. This list from OWL has many of the polyatomic anions listed in the other document. This list also has the other exception, permanganate. Manganese is a metal, and so is chromium. So these three polyatomic ions, unfortunately, are not like most polyatomic ions that are made up of nonmetals. But you'll get the hang of it once you begin to name many compounds. The charge on metal ions for groups 1A, 2A, are always plus 1, plus 2, respectively. That is, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, these atoms here, when they become ions, cations, they're always going to be positive 1 plus one. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, radium, when these atoms become cations, they're always going to be positive two. Charges on monatomic nonmetals are as follows. Those in group 7A become negative one. Group 6A negative 2, group 5A, negative 3. Here's group 7A, the halogens. When these atoms become anions, negatively charged atoms, always be negative 1. Oxygen and sulfur, the two common nonmetals from this group that you'll encounter, always negative 2. Nitrogen and phosphorus, always negative 3. You will not encounter ionic compounds where carbon itself is an anion. 
if the metal is a transition metal in a transition or group 3A, 4A, 5A metal, a Roman numeral may be needed. The value of the Roman numeral is the charge of the metal ion. There are common transition metals that traditionally do not require Roman numerals. They are silver, zinc, and nickel. There are a handful of others, but silver, zinc, and nickel are the ones you encounter. So many of these metals here in the transition area and the inner transition area require a Roman numeral in the name. That is because these metals can exist in different charge states. For example, iron can exist as iron 3 or iron 2. So if one says, I have some iron chloride, more information must be provided. What type of iron chloride do you have? Is it iron 2 or iron 3 chloride? So the complete name would be iron 2 chloride or iron 3 chloride. And the 2 and the 3 would be included in the name as a Roman numeral. One can determine the charge on the transition metal simply by knowing the charge of the anion. And one can do that simply by looking up a polyatomic ion in the list or memorizing them, or just knowing that if it's a monatomic anion, nitrogen and phosphorus always negative three, oxygen sulfur negative two, and the halogens negative one. And finally, the sum of the total positive charge from the cation and the total negative charge from the anion must sum up to zero.